a couple of summers ago, we had that blackout uh, right in the middle, and I was actually in the middle of a bris in a synagogue in a social room downstairs with no lights, and the lights started to flicker, and I thought one of the kids was like playing with the lights, and it turned out that was a few moments later, the lights actually went out when I was in the middle of the bris itself. You know, it was like really seconds where the lights went out, the cut was made, and then I was able to proceed, but it was, uh, there was a tiny bit of light, but no harm came to the baby and everything turned out just fine, thank God. Orthodox and I perform brises uh, for Jewish interfaith and occasionally non-Jewish families, a religious ceremony where the child is connected to an ancient promise, a 3,500 year old promise between God and Abraham, uh, where God said to Abraham, if you keep my laws, I will give you the rain in its season, your harvests will be bountiful and your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. For the Jewish people, the bris ceremony is not done for health reasons. That's a modern concept for the Jewish people. It is the sign of that ancient promise. I was trained as a moil 33 years ago. Since then, I've done about 20,000 brisses and circumcisions. The central feature to a traditional bris is its brevity, and not only in terms of the ceremony, but also the actual circumcision, which takes under 20 seconds. And as a traditional moil, I'm obligated by Jewish law to have the gentlest, the quickest way to do the bris. Uh, anything which would increase the discomfort to the child is actually against Jewish law. I located a teacher in Israel who was willing to teach me and 12 of us came to see what it was about and by the time this meeting was over there were three of us left standing. We went around with him first observing and then helping out with the uh, ancillary things related to the bris, whether it was setting up the instruments or packing up the instrument. Finally one day he said to you, he said to me, uh, it, was, it was in Hebrew, said, he said, Sherman, you're going to do a bris today. And he set everything up and I just made the incision. And then by the end of the course, I did several brises from start to finish. Once he was happy with my abilities, he gave me a certification, which I then was free to go out into the world and circumcise little Jewish babies and enter them into the covenant. The very first bris that I did solo here in the United States was in February of 1978. That particular day was one of the worst blizzards in New York City history. And so knowing that the weather was gonna be bad, I went out to Brooklyn the night before and not only were there no guests, there were only six of us there. The subways were shut down, so that very first bris that I did solo um, was a, a very nervous experience. But eventually, you know, after a few hundred, it got to be a little easier. I, I usually don't discuss how many brises I do in a week or my weight, but the most I've done in a day was nine and that once included a set of triplet boys and six individuals, and another time it was two sets of twins and five individuals, and that second time was on a short Sunday in February, which was quite a feat, and oftentimes I'll have one of my kids as my driver so I don't have to worry about parking, so that helps a lot, especially in New York City. Many years ago I had the privilege of being at a bris with a moil who had just retired. He was the beloved moil of this community, and this was the first bris he was doing where he was attending, where he wasn't actually doing the bris. And I got to watch him, and it was a very interesting thing to see. And I just said to myself at that time, I hope God gives me the knowledge to know when to stop. Now, you should know many moils, you know, we don't have to retire. As long as our eyesight is good and our hands are steady, we can continue to perform this beautiful mitzvah. But, you know, listen, um, as long as I can, I will.